Hi, this is Dr. Setka. The purpose of this video is to provide you with some background on Susan Glassbell's short story, A Jury of Her Peers. Sometime around midnight on December 1st, 1900, John Hosick, a well-to-do 59-year-old Iowa farmer, was attacked in bed by an axe-wielding assailant who beat out his brains as he slept. His wife and the mother of his nine children, Margaret, became the prime suspect after neighbors testified to her long-simmering hatred of her abusive spouse. She claimed that she had slept through the entire attack. She was arrested for murder and put on trial. Covering the murder and the trial for the Des Moines Daily News was a young journalist named Susan Glassbell, who went on to become the first woman to win the Pulitzer Prize for drama. The unusual circumstances of the Hossack murder inspired her to write the play Trifles in 1916, and later the short story that you're reading for this week, A Jury of Her Peers, which was published in 1917. During the trial of Margaret Hossack, neighbors specifically testified that John Hossack was a violent and abusive man who had frequently threatened his entire family and who had made his wife and children fear for their lives on numerous occasions. Neighbors had apparently often intervened to quiet him. Despite their testimony, these same neighbors made it clear that they thought the family should have kept its troubles to itself. After one incident, a year before the murder, men in the neighborhood induced Margaret Hossack to return home and accompanied her to convince the Hossacks not to separate. The family itself was not forthcoming about the environment in the home while testifying during both the coroner's inquest and the subsequent trial. In 1917, when Glassbell published A Jury of Her Peers, women still did not have the right to vote or serve on juries in most of the United States. Even after the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution in 1920, which guaranteed women the right to vote, individual states retained the power to discourage women from jury service. It was not until 1975 that the Supreme Court denied states the right to exclude women from juries. Glassville's short story, then, takes up important questions of justice and seems to argue that women might have a different relationship to and understanding of justice at a moment when women were excluded from full participation in the justice system. Even though women couldn't serve as jurors on the Hossack case, jury selection took longer than usual as many potential jurors were excused because they thought that Margaret Hossack was guilty. Law professor Patricia Bryan contends that many of the neighbors presented testimony damaging to Margaret Hossack's defense. According to one newspaper account, the women testifying in the trial seemed either unaware of the impact of their testimony on the defendant or not averse to making a strong case against her. The sheriff's wife was one of the few women who seemed to show public sympathy and support for Margaret Hossack. According to Professor Bryan, the case against Hossack presented during her first trial was based on strong circumstantial evidence. Nothing in the case clearly proved that Mrs. Hossack was the attacker. Nevertheless, in their closing arguments, Prosecutors focused on evidence that seemed to prove that Mrs. Hossack was lying in certain critical aspects of her story, including her claims that she was in bed when the attack occurred. While prosecutors highlighted the discord in the home to establish motive for the crime, the defense team downplayed the environment in the home preceding the murder, not wishing to provide a motive for Margaret Hossack. Keep in mind at this time, self-defense uh, in response to domestic violence was not uh, an admissible um, excuse, so to speak. The defense maintained that Margaret Hossack's experiences were irrelevant to the case and made much of a reconciliation. 
The defense maintained that Margaret Hossack's experiences as an abused wife were irrelevant to the case and made much of a reconciliation that apparently had been brokered between the couple the Thanksgiving prior to the murder. Professor Bryan claims that even though the prosecution could show that Hossack had the means, the opportunity, and the motive to kill her husband, the prosecution still faced an obstacle of convincing an all-male jury that a woman was constitutionally capable of murder. Some historians believe that at the time of the Hossack trial, juries were lenient with female defendants, especially those who were, quote, feminine in manner. Based on their analysis of trial accounts, Brian and the historian Ann Jones conclude that defense lawyers for women who were tried contemporaneously to Hossack relied on stereotypes and idealized beliefs about womanhood and the institution of marriage that appealed to all male juries. Many guilty women, they maintain, went free during this period. As a result, the prosecutors did their best to portray Hossack as unwomanly to counter the reluctance of an all-male jury to accept that a woman might be capable of murdering a man, let alone her husband. Some scholars believe that questions about Hossack's character were raised because she had aired her family's dirty laundry in public by speaking to the neighbors, thus violating a social taboo of the times. Brian claims that to an all-male jury of the day, Hossack had behaved in a way that was uncharacteristic of a good wife and mother, by airing her family problems. She notes, it seems unlikely that Susan Glassbell concluded that the jury could not have judged Margaret Hossack fairly because neither of the competing stories told in the courtroom fully represented the complexities of her life or raised the appropriate questions. Margaret Hossack was convicted during her first trial and sentenced to life imprisonment. The Iowa Supreme Court reversed the verdict and granted her a new trial. Family members urged defense lawyers to seek a change of venue for the second trial because of their concerns that she would not be judged fairly by the members of her community. During the second trial, one newspaper account noted, It is generally conceded that the women have great sympathy for Mrs. Hossack, regardless of the formal tr former trial or the statements of the prosecution. Another account noted Hossack was talked to by women and girls who shake hands with her, consoling her, and expressing their sympathy. Whereas during the first trial, the jury hardly deliberated at all before rendering its verdict, during the second trial, the second jury deliberated for 30 hours and was unable to reach a verdict, resulting in a hung jury. Hossack was not retried a third time. Two weeks after the second trial ended, the Board of Supervisors of Warren County in Iowa passed a resolution that it would not aid prosecution and that the case should be dismissed. The state's attorney in Madison County, where the second trial took place, issued a statement that he thought Hossack was guilty, but there was no new evidence to make a difference to a verdict in another trial. A year later, he issued another statement urging the case be dismissed, not because Hossack was innocent, but because it will be impossible to secure her conviction. The trial of Margaret Hossack clearly haunted Susan Glassbell, who wrote about it 16 years later when she wrote her one-act play, Trifles. And in a, the following year, A Jury of Her Peers, which was published in 1917. The short story in the play prompt the kinds of questions that Glassbell believed should have been asked at Margaret Hossack's trial. What were the conditions of Margaret Hossack's life? What drove her to commit such a brutal, uncharacteristic crime after so many years of marriage and after nine children? And that's what you're going to be thinking about as you read this story. Here's a list of questions that you may want to consider as you read the short story. These will certainly help you kind of unpack um, some of its deeper meanings. Here's the first question. The men and the women communicate very differently in this story. Consider how the men's communication with each other and with the women impedes their investigation. How would you describe the women's style of communication? 
And why is it more effective in this case? The next question. The story foregrounds the issues of voice and silence in the right household. What does the story indicate about voice and power through its treatment of Mr. Wright's apparent reluctance to install a party line telephone, Mrs. Wright's history as a choir singer, and the fate of the canary? Finally, at the same time that Glassbell investigated the murder case and wrote her play and short story, Women in most states were excluded from jury service and did not have the right to vote. With this in mind, what is the significance of the title of the story, A Jury of Her Peers? Thanks for your time and attention. I hope you enjoy the story.